So, you know, now I stop and think, am I willing to practice it before I preach it? Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now let's go to Second Corinthians chapter 4. I think you'll notice that all the passages I'm going to read, all three passages, have got to do with a balance between death and life. Second Corinthians chapter 4, beginning perhaps at verse 7. Second Corinthians 4 verse 7, But we have this treasure in earth and vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may, might be made manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. And then in Philippians chapter 3, I hope I can get around to preach on these, they're so good. Philippians chapter 3, we begin at verse 8 and read through verse 10. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You know, for years and years, I mean 20 years or more, I used to read that 10th verse and I would say, Lord, I know it's in the Bible. I'm sure it's right, but to be honest, I can't say it. And I don't want to say anything I don't mean. I mean, Paul said it, it's in the Bible, but to say that I want to know the fellowship of your suffering, I just can't bring myself to say it. So I have a pending file that I put things in when I can't ignore them and I'm not ready to deal with them. So I just have my pending file and I slip them in there. Well, gradually over the years the Lord has dealt with me to the point where with a kind of gulp I can say it, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. I, I hope I'll be able to explain this. In some ways it's perhaps difficult to say it, but this is the second law of spiritual progress that I have learned. It's in the scripture. Uh, let's go back to Matthew 16 and look what he says there, first of all. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I believe there are certain specific steps that we cannot avoid if we're going to follow the Lord. The first one is to deny ourselves. Somebody said that's very simple. To deny means to say no. And to deny yourself is to say no to yourself. Yourself says I want and you say no. And I believe that is really the first requirement for following the Lord is learning to say no to myself. Let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. The second thing that Jesus says we have to do is take up our cross. Now I do believe the cross is voluntary. It isn't imposed upon you. You can take it or refuse it. But if you don't take it, you can't follow him. What is the cross? It can be defined in many ways, but I think one of the best definitions I heard is the cross is where your will and God's will cross. There is a cross for everyone. There's a hymn that says that. It's also true. The cross is the place where you die. You don't have to go there. But we sung a very, very beautiful song which said that if we follow his love, it'll lead us where? To Calvary. There is no bypassing that. There is no other way. Let's look on the next verse. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now that's the paradox. If you want to find life, you have to lose it. And you have to lose it before you find it. 
It's always faith. I believe in the kingdom of God. God has got a precise price tag on every item. If you want it, it costs that much. God never has a sale. <laughs> but the good side to the situation is there's no inflation. <laughs> the price is just the same as it was 19 centuries ago. It hasn't changed. Now, what does it mean to lose your life? I want to try to explain this in a very practical way, not in an emotional way, not to be tell you a sob story about a missionary laying down his life in darkest Africa, but to relate it in a very practical way. There, there are three words in Greek that are translated life in the New Testament in English, and it's really important to distinguish them. If you want to do it, you can always do it through a concordance, either Young's or Strong's, because they separate the words according to the original word that's translated. So it's not a secret that's confined to a few people. Anyone that's got enough money to buy a concordance or friend to lend it and willing to work at it can find these things. Uh, the three words are zoe, which in Greek means basically divine life. That's a little oversimplified, but in John 1, 4 it says, In him, Jesus Christ, was life. And in 1 John 5, 12 it says, He that hath the Son, S-O-N, hath the life, zoe. That's essentially a life which we cannot have apart from God. Its source is God. The second word is bios which gives us the English word biology. And that means basically, Jesus talks about the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. The word is bias. It means the kind of life that every person has. Getting a job, getting married, finding enough food, that whole realm of physical, material life. But the third word, the one that's used here, is the Greek word psuche, which gives us sort of English words like psychology, psychic, though they're not exactly in line with the meaning of the Greek. Now the Greek word psuche means soul, S-O-U-L. And that's what Jesus said. He said, if any man will, let's look at the words and get them right, for whosoever will save his soul shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his soul for my sake shall find it. What does it mean to save or to lose your soul? I want to try to illustrate that to you in a practical way. When I came into the ministry of deliverance, uh, I got, like most people, I got caught up with the dramatic spirits of suicide and witchcraft and anger and addictions. And it was all very dramatic and resentment and so on. But after a while, I began to realize that I was only dealing with small branches of man's total problem. For instance, just to give you an example, I discovered that if a person has an addiction, it almost always arises out of a frustration. So you don't solve the person's problem if you just deal with the addiction, but don't deal with the frustration. And as I went on, I began to see always going further and further down from the twigs to the branches to the limbs and then to the trunk. But then I read in Matthew 3.10 where John the Baptist says, now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And I saw that in actual fact, if you really want to get rid of the tree, you don't just cut off the branches, you don't even just cut down the trunk, you've got to get to the root. And the root is below the surface. Now that, I believe, is true of human nature. And I, I would say that the root of man's problem is his self-life, the ego, the I. And in my mind, I, well, I once drew a little diagram of that tree, and the line where the earth comes and then what's below the surface that you don't see. And most people resent you going below the surface. You know that? And uh, I, I, in my mind's eye, I drew three roots. One big central root and one on either side. And I would say those are the roots of the soul life that we have to lose. And each of them begins with an I. The big central one is I want my will. The one on the other side is, I feel, my emotion. And then the other side, I think, my mind. I want, I feel, I think. You study unregenerate man, he's ruled by those three I. I want, I think, I feel. That's the soul in its rebellion against Almighty God. The soul is the rebellious area of man. Jesus says, if you want 
The life that God has, you've got to lose that. You've got to let it go. You're no longer to be governed by, I want, I think, I feel. There's got to be a death. And if you're willing to let them die, there'll come a new life. But if you hold on to them, you never find the life that God has for you. I don't mean that you go to hell or, or heaven. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about finding the life that God has for you here and now. If you want that life, you've got to lose the other first. If you're not willing to lose it, you won't find it. And it's a death. Death is never pleasant. Let no one ever deceive you with pretty words about death. Death is the last enemy. Thank God that Jesus has conquered death. No one welcomes death. No one ever will welcome death. Let's go to the next passage I read, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See again the contrast. Always bearing about, um, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 4.10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. If you don't carry the death, you can't manifest the life. Verse 11, for we who live are continually being delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's divine healing and divine health. But you see, there's a basic requirement. Your own will, your ego, your ideas, your desires, your ambitions, shut off the life of God. As long as you cling on to them, his life cannot flow through you. So then you come to this statement, verse 12, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Do you want to minister life? There's a price. Death in you. The, that natural soul life is at war with God. It's opposed to God. It's an enemy. It's contrary to the Spirit of God. It doesn't receive the life of God. You want to be a life transmitter? All right, accept the sentence of death. When you die, God's life flows through you. I've learned this in innumerable different ways. I remember I was going to preach in Denmark through an interpreter in 1947. That's a good many years ago. In fact, 30 years ago. And uh, it was really important to me I did well. I mean, I really wanted to do well. When I, when I got there, I discovered my interpreter didn't understand what I was talking about. And I thought, what am I going to do? And I said, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. I just can't do anything about it. God blessed that meeting in a remarkable way. Because I died. <laughs> when I got myself out of the way, God could do something. I remember being in the same church two or three years later. And they had in that Pentecostal church in Copenhagen, where Eric knows the church, they had um, a members meeting every week. Well, they invited me to speak. I thought it was a gospel service. So I came along with a gospel message. And I got they comparing themselves by themselves and measuring themselves by, by, amongst themselves are not wise. I was going to talk to sinners. Well, when I got there, again, I was not sufficiently uh, able in those days to preach that I could change my message and preach through an interpreter. So I had to preach my message for sinners to saints. And God sent a revival. <laughs> it turned out the saints were sinners. <laughs> Why? Because I'd given up. I mean, I had just come to the point where I said, I cannot do anything in this situation. Those are very simple examples. I've discovered that when God uses me to bless others, I always have to do it at my own inconvenience. It always demands self-denial. Somewhere or other, I have to give up something to bless others. All right, I've just settled down to listen to my favorite record, which is, anybody may know it, Christopher Parkin and Place Bach, and the phone rings. All right. It's a black lady I met in a convention. I won't give her name or location because who knows where tapes will end. And she wants to counsel with Brother Prince. And I give her 15 minutes when I could have been listening to Christopher Parkin. Don't you think that costs something? Believe me, it costs me something. <laughs> but I know if I do it, God will bless. Because I've got my ego out of the way. My soul life. The I want. I think. I feel, Lord, this is the time I set aside for myself. You know I always like 30 minutes alone before I go to bed. The Lord knows too well. Actually, this has happened twice. I have to be careful what I say because this lady may want to hear this tape. But I, I've got to the stage and people that know me know I unplugged my phone. In 
Florida, they've given us those nice phones where you just pull the thing out any time you want. You know, terrific progress. <laughs> and I got three phones with my number, and when I want to be by myself, I go around and unplug every phone. And when I'm writing a book, and I've been writing a book, I unplug the phone. But then if I want to phone somebody, like my daughter or something, I just plug the phone, make the call, and then unplug it. Well, twice I forgot to unplug it. And guess what happened? Each time this black lady phoned from right halfway across the nation. And I had to see God wanted me to talk to her. That's why he let me forget to unplug the phone. Well, that doesn't sound very grand and dramatic, but that's a daily life of dying to minister life. We are continually being delivered unto death. For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Christ might be manifested in our mortal body. I do think it goes a lot further than that. I mean to say it's more than just being willing to talk to a lady on the phone, because it depends what your priorities are. To me, talking on the phone is a chore. I hate it at the best of times. And that's, I mean, that's, I'm just like that. I mean, I, if I make you a phone call, you may not know it, but it's a, it's a tribute as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, I've really paid the price. I just, I'd rather the phone, you know, in a certain sense, I'd rather they didn't exist. But anyhow, let's go on to the last passage in Philippians, chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means, through that, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Do you think that Paul didn't know Jesus when he wrote those words? I mean, it's obvious that he did. He'd known him better than most of us for many years. And he said that I may know him better, more intimately, more completely. And he said that I may know him in two aspects. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship or sharing together in his suffering. There are some people that all they can talk about is crucifixion, the crucified life. And many times I find them rather miserable. I don't believe God asks us to share the crucified life until we've tasted the power of his resurrection. You notice the power of his resurrection comes first, then the fellowship of his sufferings. If you don't have the power of his resurrection, what will you do with the fellowship of his sufferings? You won't be able to handle it. I think this is going to be difficult for me to say, and I wouldn't say it in most places. Maybe I shouldn't even take it. Yeah. I think I really came to understand this when the, wife took, when the Lord took my wife home, the, the fellowship of his suffering. Because one of the greatest privileges of my life was to be with her till the Lord took her and to share her suffering. There wasn't anywhere else in the world that I would have been at that time. And if I'd not, I'd, the Holy Spirit nudged me and told me not to go on a preaching trip. And that's why I was there. But I then learned this, that if you really love a person, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else when they're suffering. And I see that's how it is with the Lord. If we really love him, we want to share his suffering. We don't want to leave him when the going gets tough. And again, I've seen this, that the most powerful thing in the universe is love. In the Old Testament it says love is strong as death. And you know death is strong. Death is irresistible. When death comes, there's no man can say no. The Bible says love is strong as death. Love is irresistible. When it comes, no one can say no. But it's like with electricity, the higher the voltage, the more you have to ensure that it's properly insulated. Because otherwise it's very dangerous. And I don't know whether you can take this, but if you can't, about 10 years from now you think it over. Because you may need experience. But the more God gives you his love, the more carefully it has to be insulated. Because if you play around with the love of God, You can control people. You can be like a Pied Piper. You can have people running after you. It sounds strange, but it's true. And you've got to be, never have you got to be so careful as when you know the love of God is flowing through you. Because you can manipulate people. The average person never felt the love of God in his life. You come there as a channel of God's love, and you're not insulated. There are going to be problems. The insulation is death. Death worketh in us but life in you. You want others to have life? There'll be a moment where you have to experience death. Don't go looking for it, because God will arrange it. When it comes, just bear that in mind, that's the price. And it just doesn't happen once or twice. There may be real critical moments in our lives where we can say, well, that moment I died, maybe you accepted a calling as a missionary. 
I can look back now and think when the Lord called me to be a missionary in Jerusalem, I had been overseas in the British Army for four and a half years. My grandfather, whom I dearly loved, was dying of cancer. He'd, the Lord had kept him alive three years through my prayer. The British Army owed me a trip back to England because that's where I was enlisted. But the Lord had called me to serve him as a missionary in Jerusalem. And I said to myself, well, I'll just go home, see my grandfather and my father and mother and my family, come back again, start my mission recording. And the Lord gave me a most beautiful utterance interpreted. It was a picture of a ship in a harbor, a sailing ship, fully manned, all the sails in place, everything ready, just about to set sail. And he said, the ship is in the in the dock, you can get on now and go. If you don't get on now, the ship will go without you. And I learned one thing. God's calling doesn't suit man's convenience. And I said no to my parents, no to my grandfather, no to my university career. And I stepped on the ship. That was a death. But I have never, never, never regretted it. Every time God is going to open some new level or experience of life to you, the price is death. It comes in many, many different ways. God suits it to your particular situation. You may have to give up a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You might be a very nice person, but not the one that God can bless your life with. God has got his ways of doing things. There was that lady that was called to West Africa. What was her name? She was known as the White Queen of Calabar, Mary Slatha. When the Lord called her, she was very interested in a man, and he was very interested in her. And so he sent her a letter and said, if you write back, we'll get married. <laughs> she mailed the letter and it got lost in the post. It didn't arrive till 10 years later. So she left for Calabar and they never got married. That was God's way of cutting that route. <laughs> so, who knows what will happen. But I tell you, God has always got something much better than you could ever dream of. God demonstrated that to me with our house and I'm not, I am not proud of our house, I'm not covetous. I've walked out of two houses, left them fully furnished and never gone back to them. So, you know, I've been tested that way. But God showed me and he's shown me again and again and again in every area of my life. If I will let him plan, he'll plan better than I would ever do it for myself. I mean that, better every way, on a higher level. But, always, the price is death to my own idea, death to my own will, death to my own feeling. If you want to find your life, what do you have to do? Lose it. If you hold on to it, then you do lose it. You've heard about, I think, one of those missionaries that was killed in South America some years back. I forget which one it was, but he wrote this in a book, and I really, I'll leave it with you. I think I can't say it any better. He said, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So when the choice comes, remember you're not a fool to give up what you can't keep to get what you can't lose. God bless you.